The first half of my working life was as a general practitioner, so I was a GP for about 10 years. And then I came into palliative medicine and have been working both clinically as a consultant and <coughs> in research. And I don't have a degree in economics. <laughs> Um, but what I would say is I'm bringing to this a very pragmatic approach. So Karen was talking about different policy approaches, and I'm bringing a pragmatic policy approach. What I love about research is that I think it requires two different perspectives. It requires a very detailed, ground-level, robust view of all the fine details, but it also requires a 30,000-foot view where you look at the broader context. And I love the fact that one needs both those perspectives. And I'm going to endeavour in this presentation to bring you both of those perspectives around funding systems for palliative care that we have gleaned from our recent work. It's quite a challenge because I don't have time to tell you about the whole of a system in one country. But I'll try and give you the, the bigger view and then illustrate it with points. So when we're thinking about a healthcare system, and particularly in the context of policy, I think we have to think about it in the broader context. So the actors, the institutions, and the resources that are delivering health actions, health care. Um, I have to say, of course, social care. And in this country, there's a debate going on at the moment about how health and social care um, funding flows, let alone delivery of services, uh, might be meshed together and I think that's an ongoing debate we've got to keep watching. But having said that, I'm going to talk really now about health systems. And thinking about what a health system is doing, in broad ways it's about the resources to achieve what we need in terms of health care, how that financing happens, how the services are provided and it's also something about the stewardship of those services. And if you look at the policy goals that you might propose, they are about universal protection against financial risk, so making sure we don't end up with no money, occupying a lot of people's time at the moment as we move forward with the demographic changes and the demands on the system we know that is bringing. We know it's also about equitable distribution of financial burden, and as Charles says, it's something about making sure that happens at the right time, not when you're worried about with being ill, but some other time. Um, but also it's about equi equitable use and provision of services in relation to need. And I would say that has been such a powerful driving in the development and the evolution of palliative care that we've almost lost sight of some of the other things that are policy goals. Something about transparency and accountability and also something about efficiency in administration. And for anybody who's read the funding review for palliative care in England of two or three years ago, you will have seen that lovely diagram where there was lots of coloured uh, arrows showing where the funding flows went. And it was basically a complete mess. And one would never design a system in that way, but that's how it has evolved to end up at the present time. And I think we cannot claim that efficiency in administration is really happening with such a complex uh, source of funding flows. So we began to do some work which was around a comparison around funding of palliative care between countries. And it's a fascinating area, but it's highly, highly complex. And every time we thought we'd peeled one layer of the onion, we'd find other layers, uh, and for a variety of reasons. One of the things that actually helped us with thinking about this was using this model um, of healthcare funding, which was developed by Raisa Deba and others in Canada. And I just want to tell you about it because it's a useful way to begin to get into the complexities of this area. I mean, first of all, they as a team proposed that there is the wider context of the funding model. That is the need and the demand and the utilisation, be it for healthcare, be it for palliative care. And if we don't understand that wider context, we can't begin to understand the funding issues. Uh, more, more within that context, as Charles has referred to, is the issue about who pays, who provides. 
but also the issue of who allocates, and that is really a pretty key policy uh, fulcrum, if you like, because those are where the decisions are being made. So commissioning in this country is making those kinds of decisions. And then, of course, the basis on which payments are made. <coughs> so if somebody is receiving care, how is a payment made? What's the basis? What's the criteria on which that is decided? And I think just taking those three approaches is actually quite helpful to trying to just elucidate some of these issues. Because I can be sure that you're sitting here, you've all got experience of palliative care services, and you will almost certainly have experience of some of these components. But have you thought about which part of those three that experience you've had sits, and how does it fit together? So the context is about the overlap of need, demand, and actual use of services, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in a moment. The flows of fund, who pays and who provides, but who potentially allocates in that decision making, and then the basis or mechanism by which those payments are made. Um, I think we have to think of the palliative system in the context of the wider health system, but there are features which are very specific to palliative care. And I guess what we were trying to achieve in this work was not to understand any one system and whether it worked or not, and say one was better than another, but trying to develop insights into the elements and how those different mechanisms operate so that if we put a different component in or we shape a component differently, we might understand some of the implications. So it's just having an intelligent kind of systematic understanding of how a system might be working. Uh, as we were hearing before, we have to work in the system we're in. And actually, we only work in changing that system, perhaps incrementally or perhaps uh, more radically, if we are listening to Karen's words earlier. So we undertook some work to assess models and methods of financing and commissioning of palliative services across countries. We initially looked at literature, but it's very clear that most of the evidence is in uh, nationally specific policy documents and other sources. So we went straight away, or fairly quickly, to consultations with country experts. And we actually realised also that we couldn't do this across all countries, and we went to countries on the basis of the diversity of their palliative care service development and on the diversity of their health care funding systems. And we went to 14 countries which are listed there, and I have to thank the people we worked with quite closely in those uh, various places, some of whom are in the audience. So first of all, just to look at the first <coughs> issue A, the one about the context, the need, demand and utilisation. Now this has historically been a major issue for palliative care. Because there has been limited funding, if you look back especially, but even now, major unmet needs and quite often a big mismatch between need and utilisation. Also demand, but uh, that's a slightly different issue. And if you want to just take the sort of just the need and utilisation uh, components of that, leaving aside demand, which I think is more about public demand <coughs> and public drivers, uh, you can see that there are different scenarios where you might have a somewhat uncontrolled service system in the upper left there, where there really the overlap between utilisation and need is not good, and a lot of things are being utilised but don't really correspond to need. You might have less of an overlap. You might have in the bottom left hand there um, a situation where there really is inadequate service provision, a lot of unmet needs and limited utilisation. And I think to some extent we have been in that area with palliative care in many uh, countries and I think variably still are. And then of course we want to get to the place where we've got a good overlap of utilisation and need and it's efficient and effective but of course uh, that's something of a perfectionist dream. So some of the specific examples around this, uh, just to give you some illustration and bring you to the kind of more ground level view, I don't have time to go into details of the health systems and the wider context, but just to some illustrations. So 
<coughs> one of the examples from the US was the early introduction of hospice benefit, where it was an either or. And so people had to forego their acute care and move into hospice benefit. Now, there's changes happening in that, and I'm sure Diane and others can tell us more about that. But obviously, this initially was very constraining of early access into palliative care. Other examples, um, in Hungary, there's quite a lot of constraints about the actual amount of funding uh, in relation to non-cancer. And services are not allowed, for example, to exceed 20% of the proportion of funding they get in relation to non-cancer. Uh, they also have a constraint on the amount of time in community palliative care services, so 120 days maximum. And beyond that, there is no further funding. Geographical variation, so Wales is an example here where the rural issues were playing out. Now, there were, these were in part mitigated by the provision of hospice at home services, but those were funded variably. So that was a way of trying to address some of the rural issues, and yet... Uh, there was variable fund how those things were funded across the sector. So coming on to B and the issues around who pays, who provides and who allocates. So clearly, you know, there are lots of different people who might pay and I'm not really going to go into that issue. At the end of the day, I think we all need to pay, as, as has been said. It might be individuals, it might be third party and it may often be different kinds of third party. Um, often part and part. So when we went to different countries, we often uncovered part and part payment methods where people were needing to make co-payments. Or sometimes, for example, there was a much less transparent part and part payment. An example of that would be tax deductibility, where clearly it, tax deductibility of your medical insurance, for example, is a way of evening out the cost across the, the taxpayer community. There's issues about who allocates, and I'll come on to that in a moment. And then, of course, who provides. And who provides perhaps used to be simpler and is becoming increasingly complex because not only is it provider organisations now, but also there may be public sector, quasi-public sector uh, split, and there may be profit, not-for-profit split. Um, and there may be several <coughs> layers of organisation in the sense that there may be a provider organisation who then commissions a provider to provide a service. So you get a very complex situation. And that's partly represented here where, you know, you might just have the two-part model in the top left. It could be a three-part model where you've got a third party involved. Uh, but then you might actually have a, a more complex one where you've not only got a service provider, but you've got provider-level organisations who are then taking it down to service providers, of whom there may be several. And actually, a more blended flow model is probably where a lot of, certainly um, the European countries are at, with a mixture of flows between the third party payers, the provider organisations and the service providers, and a variation in who might be contracted, a mixture of private and public sometimes. So it becomes increasingly complex and it also becomes increasingly less transparent. And that is a challenge for us all. And I think the idea we were hearing previously about a simple system which is not uh, visible at point of care, but which can happen in the background without too much complexity, has to be an advantage. Just some ground level examples again. So in the UK, we've got kind of a mixed public charitable funded sector. The advantage obviously of the charitable sector is there is access to the additional resources, but obviously limited stability in funding, especially with some of the current uh, financial constraints. And uh, in 2011, the, one of the reports looked at the public sector funding and really uncovered major uh, discrepancies. Now, one could say perhaps those discrepancies were matched by the charitable provision. So areas with higher NHS funding had less charitable provision. And unfortunately, it doesn't work out like that. It is truly inequitable. Um, there is variation in NHS spend, NHS spend per death at that time between £186 per death, 
probably up to about three and a half thousand pounds per death, not the six thousand pounds that was actually reported, which probably was an error. Similarly, there might be out-of-pocket payments. So in Germany, until recently, there's been a 90 euro per day contribution for inpatient palliative care. And for those who weren't able to pay that, there was some access to social funding, but with associated stigma, which prevented access for those without those resources. This has actually been recently addressed through policy changes, and so that, that has really helped change that inequity. And thirdly, and finally, just thinking about C, the basis on which funds are allocated. So historically often they have been not based on activity, so often block contracts, what was previously funded, sometimes with a rationale and sometimes without. And more recently there has been a move, rightly or wrongly, towards more of an activity basis. Uh, so it's very common across the different countries to see some either per bed day or per session funding model. And that was kind of one of the dominant themes of what we uncovered. Then, of course, there is payment based on a diagnosis or healthcare resource grouping, which is trying to follow some of the models that are changing in the acute sector. Um, and so in the Netherlands, there's a sort of slightly blended model with both type of service uh, and also length of stay. Um, in Australia, we know there is a per patient funding model using something like a case mix model, which I'm happy to talk about a bit further, but that has its limitations too. And a blended model is where quite a few countries are moving towards. So there is some component of per DM or session and some component based on some kind of uh, resource grouping. And of course, the trouble with the non-activity based is that it supports the status, status quo and that has been problematic for a rapidly evolving specialty like palliative care and that doesn't really allow much incentive for change and for new models of care. Uh, the activity based funding <laughs> might potentially be better matched to needs but only if needs and provision overlap well. And if they don't, it's problematic, which is where we have been in many of the, the funding models. Um, there is obviously no real incentive to reduce stay and to reduce uh, delivery of care uh, and to maximise efficiency. And there's such powerful drivers through the cost constraints now that we need to think of those issues and variable incentives for the new models of care. And I would say one of the biggest challenging challenges from the academic point of view is we don't know yet what the best case mix criteria are for palliative care and we need that evidence pretty urgently. We're undertaking a programme of work here um, which we've started over the next few years which is addressing that very question but it hasn't been well researched yet. So to conclude, I think it's fair to say that any revision or new funding model does need quite careful and stepwise implementation, careful monitoring of both the expected and the unexpected effects that might happen. I think there's an argument to have some sort of budget neutrality adjustment built in. What I mean by that is that if you introduce a new system and you start capturing things perhaps in a slightly different way, you need to understand is that moving you in a positive or negative position in relation to the overall budget and you might need to adjust that going forward. Budgets could be top sliced to help maintain stability during transition and I hope that's something that certainly here in this country we consider as we take forward the recommendations of the funding pilots. Um, there's an imperative though to get the case mix for palliative care considered well and robustly uh, and I think it isn't only about driving funding models, it's much more importantly about driving best care, driving quality improvement, enabling benchmarking which is appropriate of quality standards and ensuring that the right funding flows happen. And that's just a, an and rather than the driver for some of this change. I think funding mechanisms clearly are powerful policy levers and can reward excellence and if used carefully, can minimise adverse incentives. But for me, it is all about driving quality of care 
and delivering best care. And these other considerations are a second part of that, as Diane said earlier. But we do need this, both this system level view, 30,000 foot, and the ground level view, if we're really going to avoid some of the major pitfalls. Thank you.